Hi, this is Amir at Westhaisen with Cape Town Emergency Medicine and today we're going to talk about basic plaster backslabbing or splinting for the forearm in case of a distal forearm, a wrist or proximal hand fracture. The pattern that we're going to show you today serves as a universal base that can be modified for many different immobilization patterns. The first thing to talk about is some principles around mobilization of a fracture. An important point to remember when immobilizing a fracture is that fractures are unstable in three dimensions. And applying an immobilization method that only provides stability or support in one dimension is counterproductive as the fracture will move in the other dimensions. One way to get around this problem is to apply a circular plaster cast. In the acute phase of an injury, the potential problem here is that with swelling of the fracture or swelling of the injury, the compartment pressures inside the plaster in the arm can raise, causing ischemia and compartment syndrome. An elegant solution to this problem is a plaster splint. There are many different kinds of splints. The classic one called a back slab or a dorsal slab. It can also be applied on the volar surface, then called the volar slab. The critical thing to remember here is that if you use a narrow slab, then you will only have one dimensional control of your fracture. And actually counterintuitively, a slab like this should be the widest possible that it can be to wrap around the arm or limb being immobilized without actually touching at the bottom. Test this in every patient and you'll be surprised it's often quite a lot wider than you think. The first thing that we need to do now once we've decided that we're going to apply a plaster slab is to decide whether we're going to apply it on the dorsal surface or on the volar surface. It's quite easy. If the wrist is going to be immobilized towards the dorsum, then the slab needs to lie on the volar surface to support the hand. And if the wrist is going to be immobilized in a volar deviation, such as with a collie's fracture, the slab needs to lie on the dorsal surface to support the wrist like that. The second thing here is now to decide how long we're going to make the slab for each of these two. When applying a slab to the dorsum, the slab should go from the elbow skin crease and be measured to about a finger breadth proximal of the knuckles of the index and middle finger. If the slab is too close to them, then with extension and hyperextension, the plaster's edge will entrap the tendon, causing extensive tendonitis, which can be very uncomfortable. Measure it, therefore, from the knuckle, or about the finger breadth proximal to the knuckle, to the skin fold. This will be slightly long, but we can just cuff it over. If you're applying one to the volar surface, measure it again from the skin crease. And in this case, it's important to note that one's fingers don't bend there. Your fingers actually bend in the palm. And if you apply a slab that lies up to there, then it's going to be impossible for the patient to close their fist. So the proximal palmar skin crease is the landmark, and it shouldn't go beyond that. For this purpose, we're going to measure out a volar slab. We're going to start at the skin crease. We're going to lay it anatomically. We have our landmark there, and we'll put it down. How many layers? In the forearm of an adult, you should aim for 8 layers, plus or minus 2 to 4. A very muscular adult man would go between 10 and 12 layers, and a slight female or a young child, 6 to 8 layers. For the purposes of this demonstration, I'll apply an 8 layer slab. It's 1 layer, 2 layers. Keep the excess for later. And now I need to demonstrate one other important point. To immobilize the wrist into the forearm and the hand, I need to have control as far as possible forward so that I have a strong immobilization. However, if I'm placing my slab all the way to the front and wrapping it around the arm, it's going to entrap the thumb. And this is not acceptable. I can get around that by pulling it back, but now I'm not going to be able to immobilize the wrist. Or I can lay it towards the ulnar side, but now I've got no radial control. A good way to get around this is where the basic forearm slab pattern comes in. And we'll simply trim a hole for the thumb. 
To trim a hole for the thumb, you can use plaster scissors or rescue scissors, or I'm just using a scalpel blade on a metal surface. You can make a simple incision like that. And once that incision is done, that will accommodate the thumb. If placed on the volar surface, it accommodates the thumb such as that. And on the dorsal surface, it accommodates the thumb such as that. Another term that you could consider doing is, imagine this now laid on my forearm. This is a straight line, but my knuckle line is angled from the index down through to the little finger. And if placed on top in the correct position for this knuckle, I will still entrap my little finger. You can get around this by either folding the edge back once it's on the patient, or you could simply turn it. And this is the basic splint pattern for all forearm splints. From here you can start and make modifications for specific fractures. After measuring out and trimming your slab appropriately, the first step in the actual application of the slab is going to be placing skin wool. Skin wool protects the skin against the plaster. Start off by making a hole for the thumb. Wrap your skin wool neatly and slightly beyond where you need your plaster to stop so that it can be folded back in a protected layer. You want to have 50% overlap so that at any point on the plaster you only have two layers of skin wool against the skin. Again at the proximal end wrap slightly beyond where you would be. When you're done, discard the excess. If there is an area or a bony provenance that you are particularly concerned about, take an extra piece and lay it on, rather than having excessive circular winding done. We will now place the arm in this position to make laying the plaster easy. Make sure that everything is nice and neat. The next step is to wet your plaster. Grab this finicky end so that it doesn't get lost in the wetness. and dip it in room temperature, clean water. Allow passive dripping of water and a gentle gravity assisted squeeze. You could do some basic lamination of the plaster at this point in time, but be careful not to squeeze out all the water as it's important for the chemical reaction. Lay your plaster on the forearm and make sure that your critical landmarks are in place, which means that your thumb area needs to be right in there. You lay it. Lay it gently. This is in my palm. And my dorsal slip goes around. If you're concerned that you're too close to the elbow to allow safe movement or easy bending of the elbow, you can just roll your cuff around. I think we're okay in this case. You're not going to laminate the plaster, you may want to wet your hands for this. Roll back the edges, and the same in the palm. Note how the distal end of the plaster is at the palmar crease and the patient can close his hand comfortably. The next step is to apply the skin band. I usually start to wrap at the fracture and up into the hand. When you get between the thumb and the index finger, you can either just tuck it or you can twist it. I tend to prefer to tuck. Again, go slightly beyond where you need to be. Once 
once you finish the roll, tuck it and forget it. We'll attend to that later. This is now the time where you need to mold. The molding is going to be different for every fracture. For this, which is just a normal distal rest fracture that we want in neutral, like you're going to arm wrestle the person. Remember, always using the flats of your hands, never tips of your fingers, like you're going to arm wrestle. This one is on the back surface, and we're just going to use the thin art eminence to mold it to the thumb, and we're going to gently keep the rest in neutral. Allow enough time for the plaster to set so that the patient's passive cascade of the hand won't crack the plaster. Just a reminder that neutral for the wrist is dorsal deviation of 30 to 45 degrees with the hand in a comfortable position beyond that. Now we're going to get to why we wrap this beyond the edge. Instead of it leaving like that, just tuck it in under. It's an extra safety layer that makes your slab look neat. If concerned that you may be squeezing in on the skin here, a slight fluting outwards to make it more comfortable for the patient. Up in the hand here again, you can see we have to be on it. So we're going to tuck in the knee. And tuck in under the knee. Make sure that your critical landmarks are free. In this case, the little finger. You can also flute out or trumpet out a little bit there. The hand can close comfy. Yeah. The thumb is free, you can flip out around the thumb, and the index finger is free. If you look at the position of the hand from the side, you can see it's a nice neutral position for the forearm. The final step now would be to fix this. You could use plaster, but that's expensive. So instead of plaster, just use some of your discarded plaster of Paris, wet it, laminate it in. And as that dries, it will keep everything together. There you have it. A nice, neat, universal pattern for forearm plaster of Paris splinting, which can be applied on the volar side or the dorsal slide and trimmed in specific configurations depending on the fracture and the position of immobilization that is required. And that's it. Basic forearm plaster of Paris splinting. Thank you.